Greetings, friends. Such beautiful weather we're having here. Um, the droughts and the heat waves and blah, 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 all that actually here in Hawaii has created um, some pretty nice weather. Uh, where we usually get a little rain almost every day. Now the rains have kind of separated by about a week apart. Um, they, they come in earnest when they come, but for the most part, it's been dry, sunny, good trade wind breezes coming through here, and well, I can't complain. Uh, now, because of the fact that it isn't raining, we are seeing record high temperatures recorded and also record low temperatures recorded. Now, that might not seem intuitive, um, but a lot of you folks know out there that you know when when you get a clear sky when the clouds break um, that the heat will rise into outer space with nothing to stop it as it goes off the planet and so you get what's called a radiation frost sometimes uh, you could you know it could have been 85 degrees that afternoon be clear sunny beautiful you'd be laying around by your swimming pool and you go to bed and maybe it was 51 degrees by the time the sun set you get up in the morning, and if you lived in northern Wisconsin like I used to, uh, it would be at 32 degrees by dawn. There'd be frost on the pumpkins. Uh, that's because without the clouds, there's nothing to keep the heat in. Clouds are like a blanket. Uh, yeah, so because of the nice nights and because we've been quite successful with these cokey frogs, at least in the general area where I like to relax outdoors in the evening. Um, there are more frogs per square foot than you could imagine. Oh my goodness. Until we started going after each and every one of them, uh, I would not have believed how many frogs we could pull out of a small area. Um, so far, right in front of my porch over there where I like to sit in the evening, I've found 20 of them. Uh, <laughs> right now, it's really quiet over there. And because of the fact that it's nice and quiet and the sky is clear, well, I brought out the telescope. And so we've been doing stargazing now for a while. Yeah, has anybody else noticed the day before yesterday that uh, the nearly full moon uh, one day passed and Mars which is very large right now. It had a conjunction where the Mars and the moon, you know, the moon slid over the top of Mars from our point of view. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it's been quite fascinating. We also had uh, Jupiter is very close. Um, Saturn is also pretty close to us right now. And at the moment, it is possible in one glance to see both Venus, uh, Jupiter, uh, Saturn, Mars, and uh, I believe Mercury's out there somewhere, but it's so tiny, I have never really been able to, but once, been able to pick out Mercury. Um, and Mer Mercury is, uh, by the way, for those of you who are astrologers, not astronomers, is in retrograde. Uh, from our point of view right now, because the way orbits work, it looks like it's going backwards to us. Uh, and, of course, that's usually a scary thing for astrologers. Usually on a Mercury retrograde orbit, uh, world leaders have a tendency to die in office historically uh, on retrograde Mercury. So we'll, <laughs> we'll see about that one. Huh? Um, anywho, uh, there's been some really interesting astronomy at the moment. When I put the scope on Jupiter the other day, uh, we could pick out four of the moons. You could see four of the moons in orbit around if I'd waited around long enough, I, you can see them actually. One will turn off as it goes behind the planet and another one turns on as they're circling around. Um, I, it started to cloud up a little bit though and so I had to give up uh, before I got to watch the orbit of the moons around Jupiter. But um, it's been quite spectacular. And well, you know, I've done videos in the past, at least one, about merging the ancient with the modern. You know, things move so fast today. Everything is changing so quickly. Uh, we're just really <laughs> on an accelerated thing here in that, 
you know, what was true yesterday is no longer true today. And I mean, I was born in the days of the, the vacuum tube and a radio, you know, the television had barely been invented, blah, blah, blah. You know, as I always said, uh, the days of the Ford flathead, <laughs> back before Ford cars had overhead valves and the engines and so on. You know, there's a space age is on us, and well, now we're starting to look at uh, general artificial intelligence, and um, you know, it's up to Elon Musk. Uh, he's going to merge us with it, so that we'll actually uh, all basically be permanently wired into the internet. I'm not really looking forward to that one myself. But things just change so fast; it's destabilizing, really. Um, you know, I, I don't think we really give uh, um, things the chance they should for the caution we should take when we introduce some of these new technologies and things into our societies. I think we should be a little more careful about it. Uh, you know, kind of weigh them, go in soft, go in careful a little bit. Um, we don't, though. We just, oh, wow, it's a smartphone. Oh, wow, social media, you know. And so, oh, wow, artificial intelligence, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we don't think about it too much. Um, there are issues. Anyway, I think because our culture is so attracted to everything that is new, you know, new, modern. Um, I've seen this my life, and I was really worried when I was a young man about getting old because I knew old guys like me, nobody wants them around, you know. We're not interesting in this culture anymore. It's only the new stuff, you know, that's really exciting. Um, actually, I realize that there's a flaw in our judgment as far as the fact that we don't venerate age because as I got older, I actually became a little wiser. <laughs> there's a couple of things I could probably share with the rest of you that I picked up over the years, but, you know, we just don't venerate the wisdom of age in the culture much. Here in Hawaii, we do. You know, um, we there is respect for the uh, kapuna, the the aged people. We look out for them. We realize they have value. Uh, they know things that the youth don't know, and so on. And so the, there is still a cultural space for them here. So I'm in a great place to be. But it is again this culture of new, 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 exciting, wild, the latest thing. You know. Um, and in the meantime, what happens is we often leave behind stuff, you know. Well, you know, there's still people who collect vinyl records, all right. You know, it doesn't, things don't completely disappear. But in general, what was old uh, is old and it's considered no longer modern and, and we're moving forward all the time in America. Um, I think it's really important that we actually hang on to and exercise things um, that we have been doing for a million years. That these ancient activities for humans, they, they help keep us centered. I think they keep us psychologically balanced. When we engage in activities like fishing, you know, like gathering wild foods, um, maybe using a bow and arrow, um, activities like planting your own food, uh, growing your own food, activities like saving seeds or sowing seeds. I mean, I, I'm thousands of years in the past, every time I broadcast a cover crop, you know, uh, I can hear all of my ancestral farmers throwing seeds at the same time. Uh, there are a lot of things. I refer to it as pounding on drums, you know, the beating on a drum, uh, just making a rhythm. It's a real good thing for us modern people. If you spent two hours on Facebook, I highly recommend you spend at least a half an hour beating on a drum. Um, it will center you. It will bring you back to why we're human and why we're good at certain things, you know. It gives you the reason uh, of, of why we're here and, and, and who we are in a way. Um, it defines us. Um, yeah, there's other activities. Dancing. Dancing is so primitive. You know, it's way back. And I'm not referring to, you know, ballroom dancing. I'm talking about just, <laughs> just 
randomly throwing your body around, you know, to the drums. Uh, yeah, painting, illustrating things, drawing, uh, carving an object, decorating something, you know. Uh, it used to be that we didn't just make a bowl, we decorated the bowl. And maybe the decorations had meaning. They were also maybe beautiful. You know, it's, it gets deeper and deeper as you start to look into these things. Well, so it was the other night that I realized that I have this list of ancient activities that I am always engaging in. Um, they do keep me centered. But I realized when I brought the telescope out and I was watching the, the, the planets that now this is an ancient activity. Sometimes we think of astronomy as being, oh, like, oh, so modern, but no. Uh, it's, wow, it's as old as it gets. Marking the stars is what I call it. I mean, it's the story of Stonehenge. It's the story of all those funny circles of rocks that you'll find all over the planet. Pick them out on Google Earth. You know, it's, it, it is something that humans have done since the beginning of time. They mark the stars in order to tell time. The original calendars, um, you know, it would be just basically rocks in a field. They're going to tell you when the shortest day of the year came, when the longest day of the year came, uh, maybe when it was the equinox and it was time to plant crops, you know, certain things like that, activities that had to do with certain alignments. And as you start marking some of the stars, you find out that they weren't stars after all. Maybe they were planets. And if you realize that, then by marking them so you can determine their orbits, you can do math that will tell you basically how far away that thing is, how long it takes it to make a circle, and so on and so forth. There is a whole lot you can understand about orienteering in our solar system by marking the stars. Well, the other day when I walked out, and I had not been paying attention to the sky for a while, I walked out in the evening, and I looked up, and I went, oh my goodness, that's got to be Jupiter. And then I went, and I looked towards the east and the west, and I did not see an equivalent bright spot. So I assumed that, yes, Venus had already been, say, the evening star or was going to be the morning star, one or the other, and it was either down or it hadn't risen yet. So that would make Jupiter one of the brightest objects in the sky. Next to it, to the left, there was a fairly bright object that had a uh, golden tinge. Well, I know from experience that that was probably Saturn. And then I looked further over towards the east, and here I see a big orange ball. Now, a lot of things have been looking orange lately because of all the fires. Mexico's burning, California's burning, Oregon's burning, Washington's burning, British Columbia's burning, Siberia is burning, in case nobody was aware of the fact that the Arctic is also, by the way, on fire. Um, mostly the Russian Arctic uh, is burning. And uh, uh, Arctic soils, tundra, they're not really soil, they're organic matter, which that means when you get a fire started on tundra, the soil burns. Uh, so they're really hard to put out. In fact, they won't be putting them out. They're basically burning out of control. Well, that's making everything in the sky orange from here. And so our moon as it rises is orange. The sun as it rises is orange. And Mars looks more orange than usual because of all these fires. Um, anyway, so I looked over there. I said, yeah, well, that's got to be Mars. But boy, is it big. That's right. Mars was in a close orbit towards the Earth now, earlier this year. Wow, that's, that's about as big as I've seen Mars. So being pretty confident of, of what I just marked in the sky, I went and I got out my telescope, set the celestron up, and focused on these objects and said, oh, yeah, that for sure, there's Jupiter. She had her brown bands going across the face, and we could see four moons uh, in a straight plane across it. Then I moved the scope, and sure enough, the gold one had a ring around the outside of it. It was Saturn. I had it right. And then when I trained on Mars, um, Mars doesn't really have a lot of features or characteristics that make it easy to determine what it is, with the exception of size and color. It was very orange. 
and it was very large and so there's no way it was a star on any other planet in our sky other than Venus would have been smaller and so that made it Mars and I was pleased with myself because I, most of my life I've been good at orienteering that is I can always tell you which way south is which way north is um, oftentimes by just using landmarks and not even using any maps I can find my way through the wilderness blah 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 I'm quite good at this I don't get lost easy at all um, uh, and so it's a skill but I also have some ego wrapped up in it uh, there's a lot of people these days if you go hey Charlie which way south they're gonna go huh south what what you know it's true a lot of us are going completely lost. We have GPS, if that lady with the English accent on our GPS stops talking, we drive off the end of a cliff. Um, well, I was really happy to see that when I looked up into space that I was still orienteering. I still knew exactly where I was and what I was in relationship to. And so then when I realized that I could orienteer the planets, then I was also able to figure out their orbits um, and how close those orbits were coming to us. And I could basically, in my mind, manage to paint a, a general picture of the solar system. Um, I thought that was pretty cool, that I wasn't just orienteering here on the planet, I was orienteering in outer space too, that I knew which direction I was pointing, I knew which direction the Earth was rotating, and blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, all that motion that goes on all the time here all around us, I had it figured. And, um, well, there's something about never being topographically lost, and especially when you're orienteering in outer space within the galaxy, you know, actually knowing where you're standing and what part of the galaxy you're in and so on. Um, these are things that give us solidity. I mean, w w they make us stable. Um, I don't feel lost when I know exactly where I'm standing. <laughs> you know, I, it's, it's hard to qualify uh, some of this when I say that merging ancient activities with modern activities um, are going to benefit you. I, I know it does because I do it and it gives me um, uh, pleasurable reactions. I, I, I always feel more human. I, I have very little question about who I am and what I'm doing here. Uh, you know, none of us really know what the heck we're doing here or who we are. But, you know, the stories about humanity, the things that we've all been doing since the beginning of time, all of those things do add stability. So, again, I have been marking the stars apparently my entire life and didn't realize that what, by doing it, I was actually engaging in an ancestral activity, big time, one of the earliest activities, actually. Um, then I started thinking about it, and I said, you know, I should put some stones out in my field. <laughs> <laughs> you know, really, why not? This sounds like fun, building my own mini Stonehenge, you know, to mark uh, this, that, and the other thing in the heavens. Uh, well, it's something to do, right? Aloha, folks. Again, I reiterate, find some kind of an ancient activity and engage in it, but if you can see through the smoke, go on out and have a look at the stars tonight. <laughs> It's good for you. Hang loose.